and thank you for joining our session. I'm Christina Cowden, and I lead the UiPath Academic Alliance Program across the Americas. I'm excited to be the moderator for this session today. We have with us Asher Curtis from the University of Washington, Jeannie Pridmore from the University of West Georgia, and Gulrav Shaker from the University of Texas at Dallas. All three of these professors won our 2022 Visionary Educator Award, and all of them have outstanding yet different approaches to teaching RPA. Could you each start by giving us a short summary of your history teaching RPA in your department? Jeannie, we'll start with you. So yes, I've been teaching RPA with UiPath for three years. Um, I started it because there was actually a local company that was implementing RPA and they came to us and wanted to partner with us because we've already partnered with them very heavily with their SAP program. So we felt like it was a really good fit uh, for working it into our SAP curriculum. And UiPath actually has really risen to the occasion and given us some great curriculum that works with the uh, SAP system. So I started putting it into my senior enterprise and decision support class and the students do the SAP uh, curriculum as well as the introduction to business curriculum. In addition to that, I do a hackathon every semester with the local organization and it's a really fun day to really get the students to come in and spend an entire day creating their own problem statement, creatively using UiPath to solve the problem that they've got and then get the experience of presenting that to a company at the end. So we're doing it in our program, but we're also opening it up and trying to get the younger students, you know, from freshmen and up to come in and experience UiPath with the hackathons. That's amazing. Al Gorov, could you share what you do? Absolutely. So. We started teaching this at UT Dallas about two years ago, but the idea to incorporate RP into our curriculum was something that we conceptualized a little before the pandemic began. Of course, definitely with the start of the pandemic, a few of our plans had to be delayed, but the idea was every other job description that we saw somewhere or the other talked about components related to RPA. And we felt that this is a skill that irrespective of how technical your job is, how or whatever role you're playing, whether you're a developer, whether you are a business analyst or you're a data scientist or you're a business person, this is kind of an essential skill. Now, UTD was kind of moving into the low code space to, you know, for in terms of not only providing those skills to the students, but also from an academic leadership perspective. Now, UiPath was not new to us at that point of time because we, one of my colleagues in the accounting department was already using it. And when we came up with this class, we had no better name to call it. We called it robotic process automation. So UiPath really fit in very well there. Now, the, what are my students do is because I get mostly students from the information systems department. So business analytics students, the IT management students, I have a few MBAs, supply chain. So it's, it's I would say in terms of majors, they're very techno managerial in nature. So students go through some very fundamentals of UiPath to to learn it and, and one of the reasons why they like it is just because of the intuitiveness. But the approach that we use is we don't try to reinvent the entire wheel. We are you know, uh, lucky to have such rich curriculum that's available from UiPath. So we try to integrate that into our, into our coursework. Students go through some of the videos or online modules at their own pace. But when they come into the classroom, they are there trying to analyze a scenario. So every class is a new scenario. It's a new problem statement. It's like a new fire has, break, has broken out and the only way to solve it is through UiPath. Now we do have some other tools as well that we use in the class and students learn how to integrate them. And, and I love the hackathon approach because we use the same thing in our class as well. We do multiple hackathons depending on which company wants to come in and engage with our students. So it's a good way for companies to engage, but at the same time, students get more challenges to, to fine tune their skills. And then we wrap up the semester at the end of uh, the, the, the class with the certification. And we have seen significant success with that. So students, they love the fact that they're able to go from knowing nothing to being very confident with solving problems that can very well use UiPath as a tool. Yeah, that's fantastic as well. Asher, could you please share with us a little of what you do? Absolutely, Christina. And so at the University of Washington, about five years ago, we decided to 
uh, change our curriculum for our Masters of Professional Accounting program. And we took the focus of that program from one that was, I guess, what we would call a traditional audit approach to one that focused much more on data analytics and automation and uh, other emerging technologies. So as part of our discussion about other emerging technologies, I started to talk a little bit about robotic process automation at a conceptual level. And then I was a little dissatisfied myself with this being just a discussion at the conceptual level. And so what I, what I decided to do was uh, start to look at software options and learn those software options to see how could we build automations in our classroom. And so then the class took a very practical turn when I discovered UiPath and we started to work with a lot of cases and workshops and the students had a lot of hands-on experience automating many, many different types of processes. Uh, similar to the other two uh, speakers on today's panel, um, we also end off our quarter with a kind of self-guided approach to learning about automation. And we hold ours through what we call the RPA tournament. And so in our RPA tournament, we let the students or teams of students decide what they would like to automate. What business process is it that you would like to automate? And there's no restrictions. And so the students are able to put together whatever kind of a bot they are interested in, in achieving. And then we bring in a panel of judges and they present their solutions to the panel of judges and the judges figure out you know, what, what would make the most impact to us as business professionals. And they go ahead and vote for which bot they find to be the best. And so that's how we end our, our semester. And it's been a great experience working with uh, UiPath and working practically with automation. Yeah, it's great how you all have a different approach. So since you all approach it in different ways and you all have some similarities, uh, what is the biggest challenge that you faced in introducing this technology in your classroom? It could actually be technological or in terms of getting it approved or integrating it with other knowledge and skills. And Gaurav, Gaurav, can you please start us off? Absolutely. See, one of the things with RPA is, you know, when you fire your first bot and it does what it does, you know, this the sparkle in their eyes, it's like, wow, this is magic. This is happening right in front of us. But then that it, the ease to use it also becomes a reason for their concerns, because then when we start moving into more complicated cases, now, the, now you're trying to use some advanced features of creating a bot or UiPath as a whole. What I feel is over a period of time, an extended period of time, their ease with using the tool you know, they go from knowing nothing to really being very effective in terms of creating their bots. I, in my opinion, the biggest challenge that I face with my students is, is developing the approach. You have a problem in front of you, not 100% of the problems require a software bot, but then really realizing how do you go about defining a business process, getting it to the maturity where you can, you know, make a bot a good candidate to fulfill uh, what that process does. I think developing that approach is one challenge that we see. And again, it's I, I don't say that everybody who comes into this class has it all uh, sorted out, but th what is the, the, the biggest success that I see in students is the fact that after two or three weeks, they start thinking very differently about solving a problem. It's not all about, okay, we need to click here, we need to drag a particular activity, we need to code it this way, but they're constantly thinking about how they can optimize the behavior of a bot. And I think that, which is initially a challenge, then becomes what I really call the success of the program. Yeah, I love that. And Asher, how about you? Have you faced any challenges introducing this into the classroom? <laughs> Uh, as, as with any technology or any change in curriculum, there's always going to be many, many challenges. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about two that I think um, are, are top of mind at the moment. One was the initial challenge uh, relating to software. So software is, is always kind of, of interesting to bring into the classroom because there's always the risk that it, it doesn't work exactly the same on everyone's machine. And uh, we, we had some some different computing environments and, and different uh, software uh, challenges early on in the program. The way that we overcame this was uh, we were able to put our 
a license for UiPath onto a remote uh, desktop environment. And so all the students had access to the same computing power and the same software. And uh, so automating different types of software no, no longer meant that you needed to have a separate Adobe Acrobat license, for example, or, or a separate uh, Excel license. All of those things were taken care of by our remote virtual labs. And then the students could just use UiPath directly with that same compute power. The second one I, I think was, was trying to get the word out. And this is not so much in the classroom, but extending from the classroom to having uh, external parties also appreciate that what we are doing in the classroom is, is important. And uh, so I've done a lot of uh, talks with various external uh, interested parties at the UW to try and help them understand this is what we're doing with our students in this program. This is very practical. This is very hands-on. And here's an example, and we made some, some videos and so on, of students actually working through uh, bots and highlighting what they could do as part of their uh, learning experience in that course. Thanks. Wow, that's fantastic. And Jeannie, did you experience any of the same or different challenges? Definitely the technology is always the, the starting point, right? Like figuring out how to get it to work in the labs or on the virtual lab and to get the students to get it on their own machines, which I will say, I love the way UiPath handles the student licensing. It makes it super easy because students can get their own licenses and be responsible for that for their own machines. Uh, getting ITS um, to work with us to figure out how to make all the connections between the different softwares that UiPath interfaces with, that was a little bit challenging, but I will say once we got it worked out, it's been great. Um, outside of that, I think it's getting the students, because the students will come in and they'll work with it and they see it work and they see it happen and think this is great. And then their initial thoughts of, well, all I did was pull and plop some things together, right? Like getting them to understand what a good problem is, getting them to understand where it's applicable, where you can really benefit from it. I think that in the classroom is a little bit of a challenge, which um, I'm so thankful that I've got the company that comes in and works with me because that's how we start off the hackathon every time. And they come and guest speak in class as well as they say, this is how we're using it. And the students' eyes really get big when they go, oh my goodness, this software that I've been able to create in and make actual working prototypes in, you know, an hour or so, this company is using it and they can already attribute like $900,000 in savings over the course of just three months over like nine bots. That's incredible. So it's, it's hard to get them to see past just what they're doing when they first get into it, which, you know, that's just human nature. When we're all learning things new, we see what's right in front of us, but being able to bring in that, um, that corporate sponsor or partner and have them show how they're using it, what it's done is really eye-opening for the students. And then the last thing I'll say as far as challenges is getting other professors to get excited about this because it is kind of hard to get people to step out of their own comfort zones, regardless of who you are, whether you're the student or the faculty member. So, um, you know, trying to get the right partners internally as well to try to implement just a little bit here and there in other courses or other disciplines is something that I always try to look for where I can expand this so it's not just my MIS students that are getting this access. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, so kind of to follow up, what was the approval process for you to get this course into your department? And how did you grow RPA program in your department? Because Asher, you also mentioned that one of your challenges was actually getting people excited or getting them to buy in and hearing about it and knowing about it just as the initial hump. So do you have any insight on that process or what was your challenge? How did you overcome it? Yeah, so uh, it's, it's a good question. The, the excitement part is a little bit different from the approval part. So I'll start with the, the approval part. So like most universities, we have our internal approval processes. And uh, this was kind of part of a larger package of moving our program from being a traditional program to having a lot of data analytics and uh, emerging technology in the classroom. And so that that part of the approval process wasn't wasn't too bad. The the dean um, and the 
accounting department were all in favor of it. And so it moved ahead uh, pretty seamlessly. The um, getting getting other people excited about it, uh, there's, there's been multiple ways that we've tried to do uh, that. Um, one of the places I've been working with is the um, Ernst & Young or the EY Academic Research Center and Resource Center, sorry, Academic Resource Center. And what the EY Academic Resource Center does is it provides a lot of materials that are practical in nature in RPA, data analytics, and other emerging technologies. And as part of that process, we do hold a colloquium where we can teach other professors how to use those cases. And so I've been involved. I, I was actually the one who was, was running around the room trying to help everyone with their, their problems as we were putting together the bytes. It was uh, quite the workout, but it was um, a, a nice way to engage with other professors on how we might teach this material. Wow, that's fantastic. And Jeannie, you seem to have a similar issue trying to get professors involved and even students trying to get them to see past the initial what was right in front of them. So was there an approval process for you or how did you have to grow it as well? There is no a, a approval process at the university. It's pretty standard, though. It's uh, bring the software in, explain what the value is and how you're using it, and it gets pushed along and goes through legal and goes through purchasing. Even though we're not paying for it, it still has to go through purchasing. And I would say purchasing is probably the hardest group to get through, <laughs> even though we're not paying for it. But um, just going through those legal processes are always a little bit slow and a little bit painful and getting the justification of it. But after that first pass happens, there's not usually a problem with any of that. So um, the approval process isn't too terrible. And again, it's just getting, trying to get the right excitement and make the right connections uh, internally to get other professors willing to give it a try or at least let me come in at first and give it a try because most especially if you're not an MIS professor my accounting professors and finance professors where I'm you know still trying to grow a little bit more there they're a little bit more hesitant about bringing the technology into their classrooms. Wow that's great and Gaurav you as well you had an entire course named robotic process automation so what is the approval process around that? and any recommendations you have for getting people excited and knowing about it. We didn't want to spend too much time in explaining what the course is about, so we put it in the title itself. <laughs> but uh, it again, I, I concur with my co-panelists here. It, there are certain standard processes, so to get this course added, the good thing is I do have I know, a lot of people in my department, especially my department chair and people that work with him, who are very supportive in in terms of introducing new courses. So that part was taken care of there. Uh, it was more about just making sure that our reasoning to introduce this new course is right. And uh, with the demand that's there in the industry and the, uh, you know, the new kind of things that students would like to see, I think it was very easy there. Legal, of course, uh, you know, it's, it's glacial everywhere I feel, but then one of the things I've seen is that if you have done something similar in the past, that helps the legal team as well. You know, if you can show them that there is an example of similar kind of approval and, and that made it easy for us. Now, because UTD was already using UiPath, we didn't have to go through a lot of those hurdles. However, there is another thing that UTD does do is we do a security review of the tool. And our, our CISOs team goes through and makes sure that because students are using universities resources to to use that uh, the software. So all that was in place, but I would say that uh, it, it was a very supportive, uh, e it's a very supportive ecosystem that we have here. So that made it easy. Uh, any course takes about two to three months for us to really get it to the point where, you know, it, it goes from the department to the faculty senate in the university to finally, you know, because we are a public university in Texas. But uh, we started off honestly with this course as a with a with a temporary uh, name there for it, so that we could offer it. And then, because it's an annual process, even if you do it in the most fastest fashion, it'll still take one year. We were able to get it uh, put into our catalog. But I think uh, one of the things that we felt uh, really worked very well with this course was the fact that there was already demand from the students. In a lot of our exit surveys, 
in a lot of our reviews, students would talk about RPA. So I think the most difficult piece in any of this is about making the initial case. And that piece was very easy for us just because of the, the, of the demand. Is um, Michaela and I were actually at a conference and we were for an accounting talk track and we had a talk on RPA and the professors that showed up were like, how does this apply to us? <laughs> How would you say that because RPA does apply across every industry, did you have those type of questions or what would you say to somebody who asked you that same question of how does this technology like automation or robotics apply to my industry? And Jeannie, I'll start with you because your talk back actually prompted this question. <laughs> that just makes me laugh because, you know, when you think about a process that would be good for RPA, you think about structure, something that you do over and over and over again. And to me, if accounting doesn't come to your mind, I think you don't understand what business is. Because, you know, if you think about the most structured processes that aren't going to change until the laws change, that's accounting. So I don't, it's hard to even imagine somebody thinking that that would not fit in well with, well, maybe I should restate that. If you know, if you don't understand what RPA is, I guess I could understand how you don't see how it applies to you in the accounting finance field. But if you understand just the basics of RPA, just from a use case of structured, something you do repetitively, anybody at that point that doesn't think it involves accounting, I, that's just, that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, and Asher, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> Sure. I mean, as, as an accounting professor, I, I do find that kind of an amusing comment myself. But, um, you know, one, one very practical way of thinking about this, uh, I have an advisory board as part of being uh, in the Masters of Professional Accounting program. And every single one of the big four firms and all of the other large and small accounting firms are all interested in, in RPA because they understand that it has this ability to improve their efficiency on tasks that they would prefer not to spend their time on. So if they can automate something that isn't as value adding in their process, giving them more time to focus on the value adding part of the process, then they're excited about it. And there is a lot of excitement about this. It's one of the most common things uh, that I tend to talk about with uh, professionals in the Seattle area. Yeah, it's amazing how much the accounting and business is moving into technology as well. And Gaurav, do you have a similar thing, especially coming from a school of management? Oh, absolutely. You know, people always, so here's the deal. People think of RPA as the silver bullet. You have a problem in your organization, let's bring bots and everything will be solved. And, and I concur with what Jeannie said that unless you have a process that can be repeat, repeated over and over again in the same fashion, it's not, a re, it's not really a candidate for RPA. And that's what we try to tell a lot of people that traditional automation versus RPA are two different things. But I have this, I've had this conversation with some uh, IT leaders who are trying to understand the relevance. And I, one example that I can think of is uh, this, this gentleman led a, a, technic, uh, a technology vertical in one of the banks. And the question was, do you understand the power of compounding? And he is like, what do you mean by that? You want me to do something repeatedly every day? I'm like, okay, how about I save 10 minutes of your time every day? And that will lead to about, about $10 million. And he's like, how, how is that possible? I'm like, we know that uh, you know, your employees in the morning, for them to get set up and get started, takes about 10 minutes. So if we can, and what do they spend those 10 minutes on? They spend those 10 minutes on logging onto different systems. Instead of that, if there's a bot that triggers in the morning, logs everybody in, you have about 200 employees at a branch times 200 branches. And we started doing the math and it actually came to about $8.5 million annually was the amount of money they were saving just by having a bot save them 10 minutes per head. So I think uh, when you start putting the, the, the value in terms of these numbers, people start understanding it. In the past, I used to give very philosophical answers about why RPA is such a great deal for your organization. And there was not a whole lot of acceptance. And I'm, I can see the, 
the accountant smile there because the minute you put numbers in front of people and you put a little dollar next to it, everything becomes clear. So we started talking in terms of that. But yes, I, I would say there is a lot of uh, misconception about what really RPA is about. And, and I think these conversations are required because people, even before they adopt it, should really realize that, is it a fit for their organization? And in a lot of cases, it actually is because there are processes that they have, they've reached a point of maturity that they can be taken care of by a bot. And they can utilize their human resources for something else, which requires their brain power. So I think those are some of the things that we tell people as to how RPA really is a, is a game changer for them. Wow. And so many students don't have industry experience while they're in school or before they enter school. So sometimes they may not be able to see the connection to how it will work in their job. But what skills do you expect your students to have by the end of the semester? Or like, how would you expect them to apply RPA skills when they do graduate and go out into industry? And Jeannie, I'll start with you. So from an MIS perspective, when my students go out into industry, you know, MIS is not really a thing of its own, if you will, meaning that nobody wants to spend money on technology or implementation of systems if there's not a real use or power behind it. And so I always get my students or what I try to get them to understand and focus on is it's not about the technology, it's about the impl implementation of it and the problems that you're solving and how that's impacting the individual's lives that are doing the jobs. So how I actually have it worked into my course is the students do an SAP master data configuration and process uh, assignments. And then when we get done with that at that point, they're miserable because that's, that's so timely and tedious. And, and then I go, okay, well now think about a person that's having to do that as their job every day. Think about how that must feel. Does anybody want to go work in this? And they all go, no, this is terrible. I'd never want to do this. Right. And I say, okay, now you're understanding how the user feels, how the employee feels at spending their lives doing this kind of work. And then we bring in the RPA and I say, now let's use RPA to help automate some of this. And so then we go through the process steps and they do process mapping to really understand that business flow and integration of the how the process steps work together. And then we go into the RPA software and they basically take that same map that they created and use the low code process steps to pull over and do the connection. And you see, see now how, how appreciative and how excited would the employee be to know that that level of tediousness work has been lifted from them. And now they're able to do more higher order things. Now we can get into analytics for all and having them actually being able to understand and do make better decisions or be able to work at a higher level. So for me, from the MIS perspective, I want them to be able to understand the true impact of technology to make the user's life better to understand that it's about problem solving, it's not about the technology, and then to come out with those higher order critical thinking skills about how you work through trying to really understand a problem and then get the right match of the technology to fix the problem. Wow, that's great. And Gaurav, you mentioned something earlier as well about it relating back to problem solving skills. So do you have similar skills you expect of your, or you expect of your students? Absolutely. You know, it'll not give me any joy if they remember where to click, but they forget what problem they're solving. Because at the end of the day, what we want them to do is, we want them to build that approach that if a problem is sent to you, how as a responsible practitioner, you can go about solving that problem. How do you propose the right solutions? Not just anything that works. You know, a lot of times we, we tend to provide solutions that looks like a lot of busy work, but doesn't really create that value. What I want is when my students go out and they work with somebody, first of all, when a company works with our students, our students are not just working as an individual, but they're also representing our university. And that's important to us because that's the quality that we talk about. And we want these students to go and showcase not their pro problem solving, critical thinking skills, but also somebody that owns what they are proposing. The ownership piece is something which is important and we try to instill it in them. We also want them to be those integrators, those translators, because there are so many different teams in an organization that may not know how to really talk to one another. 
And we want these students to go into in the middle of them and be their translator, be their integrator, because we are all in the business of co-creating value. And it cannot happen if you're just doing our stuff in silos. The other thing, which is an unsaid thing, but I try to encourage my students to do is, is to share this knowledge. This knowledge will never grow if it is not shared. Find somebody else, find a friend who, with whom you can sit and show them what you're learning. You know, Try to teach it to somebody who feels that they cannot work with technology or it's very overwhelming for them. You know what, we've always had challenges. We've always had these fears about technology and how to use it, but somewhere over a period of time, it got, you know, it became fun. So make it fun for somebody else. Share this joy, this, this knowledge with somebody else. Your knowledge will grow and you will be able to, you know, make, pro probably provide a new path to somebody. And this is exciting. I mean, one of the things, and I heard both Jeannie and Asher talk about it. When my students, you know, when you run the bot and the first time the, the window pops up, let's say, you know, it's a browser activity and the browser pops up and it starts typing. I'm telling you, I still date. I've probably launched it more than how, well, thousands of times a bot, but I still get excited when that pops up. So I'm, I'm sure when, the, when, a new, when a student does it for the first time, you know, at that point of time, there is acceptance because it feels so doable. And, and I think uh, that's, that's the kind of skills that we want for our students because we want to take, we want them to take this path and be those problem solvers that somebody else never had. And that will give us a lot of peace at heart. Wow, that's fantastic. And Asher, you as well, do you have any additional skills to add or those same expectations? <laughs> Very, very similar. Um, and, and I like all of this discussion here. Uh, one of the things that, that I think of when I teach innovation and, and new software and, and, and challenges and, and so on in this space is about learning how to be adaptable as things change around you. And so one of the key kind of learning objectives that I have for my students is that they can adapt to a new software environment and, and work with that. Uh, the other thing that has been mentioned, I'll just briefly touch on that is kind of this concept of teaching process and understanding business processes better. And my students uh, as master's students, most of them are coming out of their undergrad and their, their experience in business is typically an internship. And so I said to my students, well, if you can't think of any business process that you'd like to automate, just think of something that happened during your internship, maybe that you'd like to uh, automate. And uh, one of the unexpected things that we had coming out of this experience was one year in the tournament, our winner of the, the RPA tournament was someone who automated the lunch orders at Chipotle. And so they put together a little spreadsheet uh, for Chipotle with all the order information in it. It opened up a browser window, went to Chipotle and filled in the form and clicked uh, for each individual in that spreadsheet. And that was surprising to see someone actually take it quite literally was a process that was from their internship. So I thought that was fun. Yeah, did they name it Burrito Bot? <laughs> I need to know the name <laughs> of Burrito Bot now. <laughs> uh, that's a good name for it, yeah. <laughs> that's pretty great. Um, so finally, to kind of end us off, we'd love to just hear what advice you would give educators that are just now starting. So all of you have already implemented this, have students graduating with these skills, but if you are now just starting, a little bit later, a few years after you, what would you have advice for your And so Asher, I'll start off with you again. Great, so I, I would say that there's kind of two things. One is you, you wanna put in the investment in making sure that you understand the software well. Uh, the students will come to you with questions that are going to be um, unexpected and all sorts of things can happen when people are trying to implement a, a robotic process automation. And, and so having a good understanding and working knowledge of, of the actual software itself is a, is a really good starting point. Then in terms of uh, thinking about cases and materials, I would say don't reinvent the wheel. There is, there is a lot of material available to you. You just have to reach out and connect with those uh, people who have the material as opposed to reinventing everything yourself. That's great. And Jeannie, do you have any advice for people just now getting started? Yes, and I would add to that, be prepared as much as possible. 
but also be prepared for things not to go right because they're not going to go right the first time. They just aren't. And maybe even the second time. And who knows when they roll out the new version of the virtual lab, you might still have an issue the third time, right? But you're going to get through it with the students. And I think what I always try to instill with my students, and again, this is my MIS world, is technology is great when it works. And sometimes it doesn't work. And sometimes there's roadblocks and we've got to get through it. And I feel like we're all in this together we're all trying to learn and and I think getting the students to understand that this is an emerging technology this is something that's in demand it's you know growing this is going to help you get jobs and we sometimes have to figure out how to make it work and that's okay like we're all we all have to constantly be learning and retooling ourselves and you know it's okay to go along the process with that when it's the first few times and and just be okay with that and the students i think appreciate the fact that you're able to keep on with it and go when it does first um I shouldn't say mess up, but the lab is going to change. You know, it's not the software itself, but the lab is going to change or somebody's computer is going to have something that's blocking something from happening. And you've got to figure those things out. And after you do it two or three times and you figure out what the typical mistakes are and then you're able to prepare the students. I know I always keep up a, um, like a in case of. Uh, emergency little checklist for the students to check certain things, to make sure they've enabled certain things, to make sure they don't have certain things that are blocking in their system from working. So if you keep that like helpful uh, hints, if I tell the students that if you're running into things or if you're getting this error message, this is typically what you need to do, building that kind of scaffolding for yourself and for your students to help them troubleshoot and think through problems when they occur, that's again just helping that critical thinking and problem solving and so I always try to get the students to understand there's there's two parts of it there's the process and then there's the making it work and we have to work our way through these things uh, and sometimes we have to do that together and with a little bit of help from ITS at the same time but it's it's okay if things aren't perfect just keep working through it because it will be it will get there yeah, that's definitely a really great advice, especially when teaching something not in your comfort zone. Gaurav, do you have any additional advice for professors just getting started? I think everything that I wanted to say was uh, covered, but I'll just add one thing. Yes, I, I totally agree with Jenny. Things will go wrong. My first UiPath exercise, it's a very simple exercise, would never run the first time in front of the students. But but here is the thing, we have to, we have to be you know, feel like a human being, you know, errors can happen, things can go wrong. I think simulating an actual work environment inside the classroom is important because in a work environment, you work in teams, you work in groups, things go wrong, you look at online forums, you talk to people, all those elements, if you bring into the classroom that will help students feel at ease because they feel that they have more resources with them. The other thing I would say is, find out what are the marketing avenues available that you can utilize. A lot of times there are a lot of ways through which you can publicize or spread the word about the class that we don't use it. One thing I found uh, particularly useful was just uh, a few days before the start of enrollment, I would send out a flyer on the email to the entire school that we've got a new class and there is this thing, an RPA and this tools will be used, UiPath certification, the partner companies, that helps them understand what the course is about. Uh, that is also a good conversation starter with some of the students. The other thing is, we also ask our students to post about their experience on LinkedIn. It's a very strong platform. It works two ways. Number one, employers get to know about our students and the skills that they are earning in this class. But at the same time, anybody else who hasn't taken this might see posts from their peers, from their friends, and they might get interested. A lot of times spreading the word I feel is a very critical thing because you might create one of the best classes, but nobody knows about it. So I would say that please explore all those mediums through which you can spread the word. And this is, ex this is exciting stuff, to be very honest, anybody and everybody who, who gets into and, uh, you know, who gets to use things like UiPath will not want to not use it because there's so much excitement around it. Whether you're a technical person or a non-technical person, there is something for everybody. And that's what I would recommend that the educators who are trying to introduce this course 
don't be scared about whether you'll get students or not. When I started my first semester, I had 17 people in this class. The capacity of 60, 17 showed interest. And by the second or the third time we were offering it, the class would get filled up within the first hour. They would open enrollment, it would get filled up. So patience is required. Sometimes things may look very slow. You might feel, oh, nobody wants to do this. People want to do it. They've just not heard about it. Thank you for joining this session and a sincere thank you to our 2022 visionary educators, Jeannie, Asher, and Galrov. Please join us for our next session with our most valuable professionals and later at the live networking sessions. See you there.